Hey guys, welcome back to the show. And on this episode, I'm going to be talking about a movie that shows us all the very real danger that comes along with trying to live out a dream I imagine many of us had as kids. Sure, The Little Mermaid painted quite the glamorous picture of what life would be like living under the sea, but a movie like this reminds us of the harsh reality of the terror beneath the sea. And it's also the name of the movie. Yes, this movie is from 1966 and was an international co-production between the US and Japan. It stars the legend himself, Sonny Chiba. And while this movie was released in Japan, it was only released on television in the United States. Maybe they thought movie theater audiences just couldn't handle the truth about the terror beneath the sea. Or maybe they just didn't think it was going to make any money at the box office. Now this poster is what first got me interested in this movie. I think this is awesome. And everything on this poster is in the movie. I think this poster looks really cool, but it is lying. But this poster is lying even more. I'm going to tell you right now. These things are not toppling over skyscrapers. This is ridiculous. The movie starts on this submarine. And I have to say, the first minute of this movie is pretty intense. The camera is always moving. It's almost like the director got dolly drunk and wanted to use it for every shot. So they have a bunch of reporters in a room on the submarine to show them a demonstration of the Navy's new homing torpedo. Does this test have any kind of connection with atomic energy? Save your questions until after the demonstration, please. See, now I'm not gonna lie. If I asked a question like that and the response I got was, uh, let's just wait until after this thing explodes and then we'll talk. I don't know, I'd be kind of nervous. And it looks like Jenny is pretty nervous as well. She says she has a premonition. So they launch this thing and the target ship sends out these sonic decoys with little party hats, but the torpedoes aren't distracted at all. They fly right past the ship and then suddenly turn around. It's heading toward us. See, this is why I'm in no hurry to go on a submarine. I just feel like there's no easy way off you know, and I like, I like the feeling, no matter where I am, that if I wanted to, I could leave. It's a nice feeling to have. And if I'm on a submarine and I get bored, all the excuses that I would normally use to leave wouldn't work at all. I can't just be like, oh, yeah, ugh, good, had a great time, but uh, gonna head out. Yeah, gotta get up early tomorrow, so gonna hit the dusty trail. No, once you're on that thing, you are on that thing. Suddenly, they see a silhouette of a man diving across the screen. Okay, so I'm going to slightly backpedal on what I just said, because there is one situation in which I would totally open that hatch and get off the submarine, even if it meant certain death. And that's if I was at a party on the submarine and suddenly someone brought out an acoustic guitar yeah, that's me two seconds later. Gentlemen, please don't get excited. It's probably very easy to explain. It could have been just a drowned body. In that case, shouldn't it rise to the surface? Um, excuse me. Is any of this going to be on the test? Because I wasn't really paying attention. There is no test. What? There's no test? I thought we were here to take a test. Oh, it's a test of the missile. <laughs> OK, that makes sense now. Wow, what a relief. Honestly, because I, I really haven't been listening this entire time. Uh, I haven't been taking notes either. I've just been doodling, actually. So, yeah. All right, well, I'm excited now. Let's launch this sucker. Anyways, the commander is like, look, there's nobody aboard the test ship. And then suddenly, the test ship explodes. And the commander is all pissed because everyone made him miss the explosion. So the next day, Ken and Jenny decide to go skin diving. Where are they going? Obviously skin diving. So on the boat, Jenny is like, hey, that dead body we saw yesterday is still really bugging me. And Ken is like, hey, you see those cliffs right ahead of us that I'm speeding towards and not looking at for some reason? Well, the Atomic Waste Center is on the other side of those cliffs, and that's where they had the test yesterday. We should totally dive in that area, because who cares about safety? I mean, how often do you get to see a dead body up close? Yeah, see, I've never been scuba diving or anything, so I'm not familiar with the terms. I thought when they said skin diving, 
that it meant that they were going to go diving naked, which I think would have been very entertaining, and I know you agree with me. But little do they know they are being watched by Professor Howard and the commander who says that the Navy is well aware of the dead body in the water, and they want a top secret investigation. Meanwhile, underwater, Jenny is taking pictures of trash or something, but she somehow drops the camera and goes to find it. Ken makes a mad dash for the boat. I'm not exactly sure why. Maybe he feels Jenny is getting a little too clingy, and this is his chance to finally get away. Jenny finds the camera, and oh my god, did you see that? Actually, I don't even know why I'm asking that. Of course you did. We all did. The only person that didn't see it is Jenny, somehow. Finally, Jenny turns around and sees this thing, tries to take a picture, and drops the camera again. Jenny, we just went through this. There's a strap on the camera. Use it. It's not that hard. So now this thing is kind of coming after her. Jenny escapes and tries to tell everyone about the creature, but nobody believes her. Weren't you under the water longer than you should have been? See, it's the typical aquatic victim blaming rhetoric, and I'm sick of it, you know? Weren't you under the water longer than you should have been? Hmm? You were swimming alone? And also, what were you wearing? Was it an enticing scuba suit? Side note, she does look pretty good in it though. Like she wears it well. So Ken and Jenny decide to dive back in and find the camera because there's a picture on it of the monster that will prove that it's real. And also, let's be honest, I don't know what their relationship is, but they're on a work trip, which is also kind of like a mini vacation. They're spending a lot of time together. It's probably, you know, some drinks, some fun. Maybe there's some pictures on there that they don't want other people to find. I don't know. Maybe they're into that. Anyways, during the dive, they find a cave. A cave that looks man-made. Very suspicious. And then suddenly, the creatures with hilarious faces appear and subdue them. Back on land, Commander Brown is like, Oh my god, they've been underwater for over five hours now. Can we at least get some chairs out here, please? Because it really sucks having to stand this whole time. They send in another diver who managed to find the camera. I guess he wasn't special enough to get abducted, though. And look, I'm not saying that I want to be abducted. I don't. I'm just saying that if I was in a situation where other people got abducted and I didn't, I would be very relieved, first and foremost, but still, there would be a small part of me that would just wonder, you know, why not? Like, what, what's wrong with me? And I, I don't think that's very strange. I think there's bound to be some feelings of abduction rejection. I think anybody would feel that way. Anyways, they end up in this very clean and futuristic looking room. And this guy walks in wearing shades. So you know he's either the bad guy or he just got back from seeing the optometrist. So they start up some machine. And the impression that I get is that it's somehow sending a signal that's stimulating his brain but quite honestly, he could just be squirming because there's a light flashing on his face and he's trying to sleep. That would drive me nuts. So Ken and Jenny wake up and Maui Jim over here is like, yeah, don't worry at all. Everything is fine. And then he leaves and Ken is like, no, we're trapped in a plastic room without a single source of entertainment. And that would actually be the scariest thing for me. I mean, the kidnapping, yeah, that would suck. The creatures, yeah, kind of creepy, but I can deal with it. Being left in a room without anything to distract me from my own thoughts? Mm. Mm -mm. So Commander Brown sends out a search party in a sub. They take a look at the picture from the camera and they're like, holy shit. Jenny is a really good photographer. I mean, look at that. It's perfectly centered. It's all in focus. And she did this while swimming? Also, what the hell is that thing? We gotta find it. But then the captain comes in and he's like, there's a new order to stop everything immediately. The Navy says your little picture of some kind of a sea mutant isn't enough to warrant a search. Those two reporters have found something and something mighty peculiar and I don't believe those two are dead. Yeah, I mean, sure, they've been underwater for, what, 10 hours now? But that doesn't mean they're necessarily dead. Maybe they found a way to breathe underwater, like in the abyss. Or maybe they pulled some kind of David Blaine type shit. So back at the underwater base, Cyclops comes in and tells them that his name is Dr. Rufus Moore, and he plans to create a future civilization 
3,000 feet under the ocean, ruled under one totalitarian government, and right now, they are creating soldiers by transforming humans into these creatures. And he wants Ken to create propaganda for him. You know, get on the good side of people. Convince them that living underwater and getting transformed into whatever these things are is pretty fun. Of course, Ken is like, no way, I'm not going along with this. I'm not helping you. And I don't blame him at all. Because so far, there has been zero talk about how much he would get paid to do that job. Which is a good question for all of you. I'm going to put it in the comment section. How much would you need in order to take that job? Everybody's got a price. Even me. It's probably much lower than you'd think. If they had free pizza and Wi-Fi, I think I'd be like, yeah, okay. Rufus is like, let me show you around my underwater base. Let me show you everything, and maybe you'll change your mind. They go into another room and watch a guy being transformed right before their eyes. Anyways, there's an operation where I guess they replace this guy's lungs with gills, zap him with some lights, and the transformation is complete. This man is now what Rufus calls a water cyborg. And I'm just wondering, who would volunteer for this? Who wants to look like this? Who would want to do this to their body? What's the appeal? He wants Ken to create propaganda to not only convince people to live under a totalitarian government underwater, but to sign up for this too? I don't know, it just seems like a hard sell. And then he shows them that they have complete control over the cyborgs, and they can make them fight by simply turning a dial to that setting. So the dial has three settings, work, fight, and stop. And that's it. And I know what you're thinking. Really? There's no setting for a little R&R? &R? How about a uh, drinks at five setting? Or one that just plainly says sex? Well, if you look closely, you'll notice that the cyborgs have no junk at all. Just, wow. So you've taken that away from them completely. Again, who is agreeing to this? Look at all these workers. I'm assuming that some of them, if not most of them, are going to go through this transformation at some point. So they're just standing there watching this like, yep, soon that will be me. I'll look like a derpy monster. I'll have... No free will, no brain, and no genitals. Yeah, the future is fun. And you might be thinking, Mark, maybe they don't want to do this. Maybe they're being forced into it at gunpoint. And you're right. But I'm telling you right now, if I was in that situation and they had a gun to my head, I'd be like, okay. Do, do you want me to pull the trigger or... Why are we wasting time? So after Rufus is done showing them how the evil sausage gets made, Ken actually agrees to work for Rufus because he says, if we do whatever he wants, at least we'll be alive because there's no other way out. We're 3,000 feet below the surface. Jenny, there is a way out. What is it? They have badges. Maybe we can steal one. Dr. Moore is expecting you. And I find this hilarious because for a second you think, oh, maybe they're going to come up with a plan to steal the badge in a sneaky, stealthy way. But no, it's just straight to, give me a badge! Anyways, they don't get very far until they're caught and Rufus is like, check it out. We've captured Professor Howard. Professor Howard then recognizes the doctor who is conducting all these transformations. Joseph Heim, I don't believe it. Mixed up in this? Yes. It's a world that makes sense. So then they gas Ken and Jenny and start the transformation. But at the same time, the submarine is nearby. So they're like, oh, crap. Okay, everybody stop everything. Stop the handling of extremely dangerous atomic waste. Stop moving completely. Stop all signals. We don't want our underwater city to get spotted. This is supposed to be very low key. I mean, they don't want any unexpected visitors. They don't want people just waltzing on in. You can just imagine in time, if the city got big enough, all the slurs, the low Locals will have come up with for people who, you know, swam into the city illegally or whatnot, you know, like, looks like we got another scuba on our hands, boys. Another bubble blower. Goggle face. Flipper foot. Okay, actually, these are kind of fun. Anyway, since they stopped everything, this, of course, means they had to stop the transformation of Ken and Jenny. 
So instead of looking like cyborgs, they just look like their skin is peeling after a bad sunburn. The city and the submarines start shooting missiles at each other, and now the city is blowing up, which causes the cyborgs to go out of control and start attacking people. And I just want to point out how crazy it is that they even managed to build this in the first place. This is a massive project. I don't even know how you would organize the construction of this without setting off any red flags at all. Just think of all the materials needed alone. It's not like this guy made a a few trips to Home Depot on the weekend and it's just like, boop, underwater city, ta-da. So since the cyborgs were designed to be pretty much bulletproof, they're now basically unstoppable killing machines going around and taking everybody out. And I don't blame them. I mean, you took away their dongs. Of course they're gonna be pissed. What did you expect? The professor manages to find Ken and Jenny, but Jenny is very upset. She doesn't want to go back. Not with her skin looking like that, Ken, I don't want to go back. Why not? I'd rather die. Honestly, Jenny, it's really not that bad considering what could have happened. Tell you what, you go home and you take a bath in some aloe vera. And if that doesn't work, then you get a t-shirt printed that says, I visited an underwater civilization and all I got was this lousy skin condition. Ken figures out the best way to kill the cyborgs is by electrocuting them and watching them die awkwardly or crushing them in a sliding door and watching them die awkwardly. And this is actually pretty funny. Rufus and his bodyguards are down the hall getting into the escape pod and they start shooting at Ken. So then Ken decides the best option is to stand in front of them and then run really fast down the hallway before anyone can draw their guns which they holstered for some reason. Rufus can't get a clear shot and doesn't just walk up to Ken and shoot him for some reason, and that gives the professor time to shoot Rufus. But I don't know, there's another awkward fight somehow, but they manage to escape in the nick of time. But it doesn't end right there, because after all, it wouldn't be a happy ending without Jenny and Ken suddenly recovering from the effects of the transformation and being perfectly beautiful people again because the professor knew the treatment to cure them somehow. And there you have it, folks. Another lesson on why you shouldn't start your own underwater civilization. Because something is bound to go wrong. It's a story I've heard countless times. At least twice. Now, I wouldn't consider this a bad movie at all. And I also felt that it was photographed really well. It's a nice looking movie. I think the best way to describe it is it's like a weird James Bond movie. And I wouldn't be surprised if it was at least inspired by or even tried to imitate James Bond movies to try and capitalize on that popularity, especially seeing that Thunderball came out the year before this. And there's definitely some similarities there. But that's pretty much it for this one. As usual, thanks for watching guys, and I'll see you all next time. Okay, you know what? I think we're in agreement here. Uh, just to go over this again, I get free Wi-Fi, free pizza, good pizza. It's up to you to figure out how to get it delivered down here. That's not my problem, that's yours. But it's pizza from wherever I want. That's written right here. And one more thing, I just added this in just because I'm curious, but I wanna know what's going on with the shades. What, why sunglasses? Is it too bright down here for you? I mean, yeah, there are a lot of lights, but whose call was that? Well, really, like, are you hiding something? Do you have a lazy eye? Are you missing an eye? Is this just a style thing, you know, to set yourself apart from everybody else? Because if that's the case, I wanna know, what would happen if I did this? And I start walking around like this from now on. Would that be a problem? Am I gonna get in trouble? You know, the bad guy from Thunderball, he had an eye patch, and that looked really badass. I'm just saying. Much cooler than what you've got going on. Sorry. I think there's bound to be some feelings of abduction rejection. It's like getting picked last for sports in gym class. Except I guess with that, there's not the possibility that you're gonna be murdered. So I guess it's not really comparable. No, once you're on that thing, you are on that thing. I guess you could say the same thing about airplanes. The only difference is I feel on an airplane in an emergency situation, I could open that hatch, grab a parachute, jump out, and have a chance at surviving. On a submarine, though, 
you know, at that depth, you open that hatch, you're dead. It's just, it's not happening. 